So after playing a Fire Emblem hack that had its heart in the right place, but ultimately didn't really work out due to its unbalanced gameplay and lackluster writing, I ended up playing a hack that's come out more recently that impressed me quite a bit. And keep in mind that this hack is still in development, so anything I talk about or critique could very well change in the coming years. Regardless, this is the Staff of Ages. The Staff of Ages is a Fire Emblem ROM hack of Fire Emblem the Sacred Stones. Similar to the last promise, the Staff of Ages is a fan game, using the Sacred Stones as a base kit to create its own story, characters, and gameplay. The project has a whole slew of people working on it, people of which I don't really feel like reading all the names for because that'd take a lot of time, but here they are regardless. And the Project Serenus Forest page is linked in the description, so be sure to check that out when you get the chance. The story takes place in a fictional world that's covered in a black mist. Two millennia ago, humans popped out of the mist and started to exist. As you do. But then big, scary, bad monsters started to appear as well, so humans started to create weapons to fight back. Eventually, a sage named Velhari used magic to create a super amazing staff that killed all the monsters, sealed away the mist, and gave humans a break for a while. Before they split off into countries and start killing themselves of their own accord. As you do. The main conflict of the game is between the countries Fortutia, Fortuia, Fortuta, and Arendin. Fortuia has the Tatilier Staff of Ages sailed away, and Arendin really wants that thing so they can have a fantasy WND allegory. The story begins following a pair of lords named Owen and Sawyer who have been sent off to guard the border between Fortuia and Arendin, introducing us to the conflict. Meanwhile back home, we've got the Queen of Fortuia arguing with her advisor, Seneca who thinks she's taken this conflict with Arendin not quite seriously. So he does what any rational person would do in this case, and organizes a coup d'etat, but accidentally kills the queen in the process. Look at me. I'm the queen now. This leads to the crown princess, Belle, fleeing with her retainer for a neighboring country to seek refuge. Meanwhile, Sawyer and Owen find it fishy that they have no reinforcements, so they retreat back home. At which point they find out about Seneca's douchebaggery, and they set out to find Belle and help her retake her birthright. And all of that is only Act 1. The Staff of Ages is a pretty ambitious project, like most fan hacks are. The creators seem to have set out to not only make their own Fire Emblem game using the Sacred Stones model, but to do so by incorporating a ton of elements from things later in the series as well. To that end, Staff of Ages feels like a more modern Fire Emblem game that's set in the visual style of Sacred Stones, rather than just being a game with recolored sprites, a few unique animations, and unique character portraits. And I should clarify that based on what I could find, it doesn't seem that the Staff of Ages team came up with these quality of life changes themselves, not that they ever claimed that they did. Several of the improvements were made in projects unrelated to this one. I find it interesting, it's a project that's being impacted by several creators before it, as opposed to, say, The Last Promise, which was fairly self-contained but influential to the hacking community going forward since there hadn't been too many projects like it before, regardless of how it turned out in the end. And these changes and additions vary in shape and size. For example, one thing I noticed right off the bat was the addition of health bars for units on the map after they take damage, something that I recall wasn't in Sacred Stones or the other GPA games, or other quality of life things like how you can now see how much health that a staff user is going to restore when they heal someone, or for that matter, implementing items that were in the 3DS era like the two range healing staffs so that your healers can heal someone without risking their neck. And then there's major changes, like how all the characters come with unique skills that grant them special bonuses in gameplay, something that Sacred Stones played with but wasn't fully refined until the later games. For the Staff of Ages, the skills are more based on the latter. Something I did like about the skill system was how characters had unique skills, kind of like how it was in Fates. Skills that related to the character specifically, that is. And what's more, this applied to the bosses as well. For example, there was this one boss who really hated Belle for killing his girlfriend, so he gets a bonus to his attacks if he ends up fighting her. And then of course there are special unit classes that were either taken from other Fire Emblem games or made up for this game. Units like Dark Knights, which weren't introduced in the series until Fire Emblem Awakening. Or for the originals, units like the Landschnecht, which is apparently based on a historical version of German mercenaries. Though, in this game, they do not look nearly as fabulous. Overall, this game brings a lot of new and old stuff to the table to try and make the best possible Fire Emblem hack that it can be. It was a game that was clearly made with the intent of older fans in mind, which works for and against it. 
So back in my last Promise review, one of the things I praised about that game was that it treated itself like an actual video game that assumed you hadn't played something like it before. They did so by treating the early levels as tutorial stages, teaching you the basic ins and outs of the gameplay, and giving you some wiggle room to recover should you mess up or make a rookie mistake. It was a hack of a popular game that would only ever be seen by people who had actually played Fire Emblem, but at the very least it was a nice touch and made it feel authentic. True, it still wasn't handled the best way it could have been, like how the level that introduces you to archers and their strengths does so by sticking these assholes everywhere. Putting your Pegasus nice that you couldn't leave at home in a very sticky situation, but it was the thought that counts. Staff of Ages doesn't do that though. The game assumes you've played a Fire Emblem and it tests you on that immediately. The first map with Sawyer and Owen was a defense map that actually got pretty dicey with its difficulty and made me a bit anxious at points because I thought for sure I was going to lose a unit. It didn't get much better with Bell's standalone maps, where it seemed like I was fighting an uphill battle at every turn, and making one wrong move would end up with a dead tomboy Pegasus Knight princess. And something also weird was that there was this inconsistency in the lack of tutorials, like how in the second stage you suddenly get a prompt from Bell to go talk to someone to recruit him. It just seemed kind of odd that there was this thing that they felt they needed to point out at this point, when they didn't really need to do it for anything else. I guess what I'm saying is I didn't need the game to do like Blazing Sword did, where they hold your hand at every single possible step and explaining how the movement works, or how attacking works, or how literally everything in the game works. But at the very least, I think the early chapters could have eased off the difficulty sauce a little bit. I like challenging games, but I also like to use the first couple of levels to actually get a feel of the game before the difficulty ramps up. I mean, Jiminy Christmas, this game is slated to have 38 chapters eventually. I think the first couple can afford to take it a little bit easier. Of course, that's not to say that I didn't still enjoy the difficulty. Staff of Ages is a challenging game, but there weren't a lot of moments that felt like it was being unfair. Though, when those moments did happen, you can bet I was raging like a nerd that felt like The Last Jedi ruined Star Wars. For the most part, Staff of Ages sets up its stages in a way where you've got several options on how you want to tackle it, and there's viable risks and rewards for each strategy. For example, the absolute hardest map for me was Chapter 8, where you have to survive like 10 or 12 turns while fighting oncoming difficult enemies. The map itself is pretty big and the enemies are tough, but there's still shops and villages to visit to resupply and get items, things that you'll probably be needing at this point in the game. You could just turtle up and wait the storm out, but if you do that you'll be missing out on valuable resources, so you gotta take the risks to get the rewards. Get it? Hey, Hector? Yeah? Shouldn't we actually, you know try to save a few villages, we're running low on weapons. And we've still got some iron axes and swords though, right? Well, yeah, but- Great, then don't wait up! Hey, uh, you also looking for a new A support? Yes, please. Honestly, this sense of urgency and risk is something that I complained about a lot when it came to The Last Promise, so it's refreshing to see it done properly here. There were several times where a bandit or a thief would spawn in to go and deny me of sweet loot, and if I wasn't booking it and avoiding the play it safe route, I wouldn't be able to stop them in time. It kept me on my toes and made the maps more alive and interesting. And when I'd complete a map that I'd been struggling with, I'd actually feel proud of myself. I'd take a deep breath and think, Man, that was tough, but I was able to overcome it and keep everyone alive. Feeling pretty good about myself right now. That's a feeling you want your players to have. That's the type of feeling you should be getting when you beat a game that wants to be hard. A game's difficulty is not a measure of how good it is. How good a game is ultimately comes down to how much you enjoy it and how much fun you had. It's true that I feel like some of the difficulty in Staff of Ages is a bit artificial, like how virtually nobody has any sort of defensive prowess in this game, bar the one knight you get, but even then, it seems like everybody has terrible resistance. Even your magic users, who are normally supposed to be your mage tanks. Enemy mages are capable of destroying pretty much anyone in your army, especially Bell. Poor girl's lacking defense and resistance, which made me afraid to use her for anything other than finishing people off for some XP. I've already talked about how it sucks when your main character is a liability to your army, and poor Belle is in a serious need of a resistance buff if nothing else. But regardless, the game rarely felt unfair. There was always a solution that didn't involve me cheesing mechanics or feeling the need to look up a guide. The maps in the Staff of Ages are challenging, but for the most part I found them to be fair. You're the type of person that likes the harder Fire Emblem games, and you'll probably appreciate this one. Of course, it wasn't just the gameplay that was good, I thought the story and the characters were written pretty well too. So, writing is hard. It's easy to write a story with a hero and a villain, and it's easy to make a setting where those two have reason to fight. What's hard is writing these in a way to make your audience care about what's happening to all of these things. 
and it only gets harder when you start throwing more characters into the mix, and you need to make us care about them too. The Staff of Ages manages to accomplish that. I enjoyed watching the struggles that the heroes were going through, and I came to be invested in their story. One of the most appealing things to me in Fire Emblem especially is getting attached to individual units due to their individual personalities, their quirks, and their motivations. It also helps if they're actually useful in a fight. When it's done well, you end up with an army that you're invested in, and will guarantee a restart on a chapter if somebody goes down, no matter how good or bad they are. When it's done poorly, you might end up with a bunch of RPG stats with anime faces that you don't really give a damn about, and will probably only restart if that character was actually useful. Otherwise, why should you care? But the characters in Staff of Ages are actually written well and do a good job in helping me get invested. There are characters that are introduced that have personal objectives in addition to helping Belle retake her throne, like the archer Stark who wants to save his sister. Also, he's a Naruto. <laughs> or characters like Aurora who first shows up as an enemy, gets converted after having a crisis of faith, takes a moment to leave, then comes back in the next chapter. It's a bit realistic in a way, with the character realizing she might be on the wrong side, but needing some time to hash out her feelings by herself before coming back later as a permanent party member. There aren't any support conversations in the game yet, true, but those are promised to come later. And for now, the game gets around that by putting a band-aid on it, with short optional talks that characters can take part in. It's always nice to see what the grunts think about what the lords are doing by conversing amongst themselves. They take moments to get to know each other, reveal some personal details about the character. It was nice, and it was the sort of thing that didn't have to be in the game at all, with support conversations coming and all, but it adds a nice little layer of intrigue and development to each individual. I think the pinnacle of the game's writing, though, comes from the villain of the first act, Seneca. Seneca is a treacherous advisor that killed the queen and is now trying to get the kingdom under control so that he can take a more aggressive stance against their hostile neighbors, Arendin. Seneca seizes power for himself with the help of some advisors, but the thing is that the game does a very good job in making him appear sympathetic. Seneca doesn't want the throne because mwahaha power. He wants it because he legitimately believes that the queen isn't doing a good job. He wants it because he fears for his country's safety and he feels like he needs to do something about it right now. Even if he did get caught up in the moment and murder the queen like an idiot, it's something that he shows regret for later. Though, to nitpick, I think it's kind of funny how Seneca's all, we gotta keep this a secret, and then the boss of the map immediately goes out and tells Belle they murdered her mother. Like, dude, I thought you said this guy was cool. It's up to interpretation if any of this puts him in the right or wrong, but you are meant to sympathize with him a little. Seneca feels like a person. He's got friends that care about him and support him. He's got motivations of someone that just wants to do the right thing, and he shows regret while wondering if his actions are just. There was actually a moment in the final chapter of Act 1 where Belle and Seneca are shouting at each other about their motivations, and I started to think, huh, maybe I'm not in the right here. Are we the bad guys? Are we doing what's right for this country? That's some pretty good writing for a fan game, in my opinion. Just looking at Fire Emblem as an example, the most well-liked and memorable villains typically aren't the laughably evil sorcerers who just want to resurrect a demon dragon god that'll devour the world. For some reason. You know, it just seems like a good plan to get behind, you know? It's the characters that have their actions fueled by realistic motivations. Characters like Ashnard, who was a psychopath, but had elements of wanting to create a world where anybody could be somebody, provided that they were strong enough. Characters like Arvis, who believed that they were the best person to make the world a peaceful place, even if that meant conquering and subjugating everyone else to do it. So, yeah, I liked Seneca as a villain. Which makes me cautious about where the story's gonna go when Act 1 ends. In case you've forgotten, the real enemy in this game is Arendon, Fortuna's evil neighbor. And they finally show up at the end of Act 1, swooping in to ruin everybody's day while looking like a bunch of Saturday morning cartoon villains. Seriously, we've got the evil emperor wearing a bird mask for some reason, evil advisor lady, and the creepy twin generals that finish each other's sentences. It's too early to tell how these villains will develop. I mean, we've only seen them for like 5 minutes after all, so there's still time for them to develop some intrigue. But based on those five minutes, I'm a little cautious. Only time will tell, though. Maybe Birdbeak Emperor will have some horrible backstory to make us sympathize with him, where his face was chomped off by a raven while he was writing poetry so he wears a mask as a reminder, and the Staff of Ages is going to be used to defeat the oncoming Poetry Slam knights that are going to appear across the continent. So, should you play the Staff of Ages? Honestly, yeah, I definitely recommend it. I thought the game was good, the gameplay was fun and challenging, the story was well written, and I cared about the characters. I'm really interested to see where it goes from here. 
The staff of agents has a lot of potential, and I'm looking forward to following it as it goes through development. There's definitely some fine tuning that needs to be done, in my opinion, like adjusting some of the early game difficulty, maybe actually giving characters some actual resistance, and stuff like that. But overall, I'd say it's still in a very good place right now, so I'm looking forward to seeing how it continues to expand and improve. Though, there are some bugs that need fixing. If anyone on the development staff is watching this, Chapter 1-9 actually breaks if you send someone down the south path of where you start. No joke, I broke the game while recording this, which was especially annoying considering that I was doing well in the south path and the bug forced me to take a different approach. Also, Sawyer is weak to dragon slaying weapons, which they do seem to be aware of at least. But could this be a hidden easter egg detail of Sawyer's secret draconic heritage that will be revealed in the future updates? There's still a lot of stuff planned for this game, like a split campaign for Sawyer and Owen during Act 2, similar to Sacred Stones' campaign for Erica and Ephraim, and of course more chapters of the game to go through. Which I can only hope right now that they're going to try and balance between the shorter and longer maps, because some of the late maps in Act 1 took hours to get through. I can't even imagine having to do this for 26 more chapters. If you want to try out the Staff of Ages for yourself, check out the link in the description below. As I said before, this game is a work in progress, so you can't play the full game yet. Of course, there's the downside of that everything I talked about in this review might be outdated and worthless in about a year. Whoops! <laughs> Couple of dudes being guys. Couple of guys being dudes. Just a couple of dudes being gay. Show me your dick, 